Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, part five of the $2,000 Cadillac build video series featuring the i7-8700K six core 12 thread CPU. Build time in this video, the camera's gonna be overhead and I've got a 32 minute long detailed step-by-step -step build guide on putting this amazing computer together. Linked in the video description below will be the full playlist of videos on this computer build. The first one, part one, was the parts overview where I basically covered all the parts, what's included and what benefit they provide. Part two, three, and four were three detailed Y vlogs, basically starting at the CPU, going through all the parts down to the power supply, talking about why they're included, what alternatives you might consider, as well as a $1,500 version and a $2,500 version of this build. If you're interested in the why behind all these parts, if you'd like a detailed discussion of RAM, solid state drives, motherboards, CPU choices, I talk about Ryzen in there, cooler choices, both air and liquid, then you definitely want to check out the three Y vlogs. They're longer, but if you're really trying to figure out, pick this part or that part, should you spend more for this or less for that? That's what those videos are for. Also linked down in the video description below will be all three builds for this computer. The $2,000 build originally suggested in the parts overview and the two alternatives, the $1,500 version and the $2,500 version, as I mentioned before. Those links are to Amazon and Newegg. Those are affiliate links. They support the channel. So if you find this build video series helpful, please use those links when buying your parts. Coming up next is part five of this build video series, Overclocking. I'm going to bring the BIOS up. I'm going to talk about the settings in detail and how to get the most overclock out of your CPU. I'll show you some ADA64 stress tests so you can see what kind of temperatures that we're getting. Be sure that you're subscribed to my channel using that big red button below to be notified of when that comes out. Before we get started, I want to give you some general PC building advice. First of all, have a large flat work surface that you can lay all the parts out so that you can see and work on everything without being in a cramped space. Number two, have good tools. I strongly recommend a good toolkit. You need a number two Phillips screwdriver. Magnetic is recommended. It's easier to get the screws in, but it's also very useful to have smaller screws as well. I will link to a toolkit that I use. It's a 26 piece Vision Tech toolkit down in the description below. And it's also useful to have zip ties. Now for $5, you can get hundreds of zip ties more than you'll ever need. But for cable management, those are very useful. I'll link to those as well. Finally, take your time. If this is your first PC build, it's just an erector set. You're not soldering or welding or doing anything complicated. You're just putting standard parts together that were designed to fit together. Measure twice, cut once. Check everything. Look at where all the screws are going to go. Look how everything fits. Try putting things in place without screwing them in first just to make sure everything lines up. This is not complicated but it is expensive. So you don't want to break anything in the process and it is possible to break it. So take your time. I recommend watching a video like this when you're actually doing your first build. And if you have any questions, that's what the comment section down below is for. And without any further ado, let's start building this computer. Here you can see the motherboard laid out on the table. First things first, you want to prep your motherboard before you do anything else. The CPU socket would normally have a black piece of plastic here covering it, but since I've actually already used this board, that's not here at the moment. The first thing you want to do is put your CPU on. You're going to press down here and you're going to lift this lever up, which will lift the cover up. You'd remove the black piece of plastic at this point. Take your CPU and line up the two notches. There's a notch here on the top there and there, and they line up with the notches right there on the motherboard. The golden triangle right here faces right down to this corner. You don't press the CPU on, these are the pins. You simply lay the CPU down gently, just like so. And you can feel that it's not going to move. It does move just ever so slightly, but once that's in place, Lower this cover first, make sure these two pins here are underneath this fixed post. Push forward on the lever, down and under. These two tabs hold your CPU in place. That's all there is to installing your CPU. If you have M.2 SSDs to install, those are next. I have already installed the bottom one. This is a crucial MX300 SATA SSD and it is going into the bottom port. The top one has an M2 shield, which needs to be lifted up first. It actually comes off, and on the back of it, there'd normally be a piece of plastic you'd take off from here, but since I've already used it, that plastic is already gone. We'll set that aside. We'll take our Samsung 960 Evo, and you simply insert it just like so at about a 30 degree angle, 
and it will rest up. It, it's flexible. It'll come down, but then it pops back up. You don't want to see the golden fingers here. You reinstall your M2 heat shield using the two notches there and bring it down on top of the SSD. You then take your screw and you screw through the M2 shield on the notch of the SSD into the post on the motherboard. Please note that most of these motherboards with a long heat shield actually have the post mounted on the end. You'll just need to unscrew that with your fingers from the motherboard and move it to the 80 millimeter slot from the 110 millimeter slot right here. With our M2 SSDs installed and our CPU installed, now we're gonna get the motherboard out of the way and put the case here. We won't add RAM or anything else until the, system, until the motherboard is inside our case. I now have our case laying on the table with both the front and the back covers removed because we are gonna need to get access to both sides of the case. There, all the various cables inside are tied up, so the first thing we're gonna do is untie those. This case has a number of cable management grommets and depending upon where you want to run your cables, you may actually switch these. But for now, we're going to leave them where they're at until we get the motherboard installed. This is the power cable to the rear exhaust fan, which will also just hold out of the way until we get the motherboard in. This case will accept an ATX, a micro ATX, or a mini ITX board, and the various spots on the back are numbered 1, 2, and 3, depending upon what kind of board you're installing. Now, we're installing an ATX board, so we want to put one of these posts everywhere there is a 1 on the board, 2 for micro ATX and 3 for mini ITX. The box with all of the parts is located in the bottom drive tray. Take it out, open it up, and it has all the screws, ties, and everything you need for the build. So I have all the parts out. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to install. And I've got my seven right here. Just screw those in with your fingers. With all nine of the posts or the motherboard standoffs installed, before we put the motherboard in, we need to put the IO shield in. To put the IO shield in, label side out, make sure the audio ports are facing towards the bottom of the case, and it goes from the inside of the case out and it simply snaps into place. And here you can see, I turn the case on its front. Each of the four corners simply snaps right into place. It is now time to install our motherboard. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine that match the posts here. The audio ports stick out slightly, so when you put it in the case, it's gonna go in slightly at an angle to allow the audio ports and the other connectors to go through the IO shield in the back. So you wanna line that up and then make sure each of these mounts is, mount, is uh, lined up with the posts in the case. My advice is to start with the center screw and screw it in halfway, not tight, and then work your way around and install the rest of the screws. With all nine screws in, I am now gonna go down each one of them and make sure they're tight. Um, you do not have to make these super tight. You're not protecting the machine against being thrown like a football. It just basically has to hold the motherboard in place. So just make them finger tight. Do not use power tools or electric screwdrivers when putting this together. And our motherboard is installed. The next thing to install is our power supply. And the reason is we need to run our 24 pin ATX connector, our eight pin CPU connector, and then make sure we have room for our power cables for everything else. Here you can see our Cooler Master V750 750 watt 80 plus gold power supply. On the back, this is where our power cable to the wall goes. There's a switch, it's currently off. You can see the nice big fan on the bottom. That's facing the bottom. That's because there's an air intake on the bottom filtered to bring cool air in. Here you can see our fully modular cable arrangement. We will install those after it's inside the system. We install this by undoing the screws on the back and actually screwing it in through the back of the case. So I'm just taking four power supply screws, or case screws as the case may be, really the same thing. I'm screwing them into the back plate, into the back of the power supply here. And then I will tighten them all down. As a general rule, anytime you're working with screws on something like this, do each screw halfway, get them all in, and then go around and tighten once the alignment is correct. Now we just insert this into the back of the case. These are thumb screws, but it's honestly easier just to use a screwdriver to screw it in. This is a very nice handy bag that Cooler Master provides with their V750 power supply inside. 
you can see all of the cables which are wrapped individually. You only have to use the cables to keep the clutter down to a minimum that you actually need. They're flat black, so they're gonna be easy to route through our grommets and behind the motherboard. This mess of cables looks more intimidating than it is. This entire strap here is the 24 pin ATX cable. This is our serial ATA power cable with four serial ATA connectors. This is our eight pin CPU power connector, which will run to the top of the motherboard. And this is a PCI Express power connector that has two six plus two connectors to drive our GTX 1080 Ti. Now there are actually multiple of these inside the, uh, the case back there, but I only got one out because I'm only gonna run one graphics card. If you wanted to run two cards in SLI or Crossfire, then you'd need two of these. I have now turned the computer over on its back. You can see we have easy access to the power supply here. We're going to take one end of this, plug it into the power supply, and the other end we're gonna run up here. There are tie-offs here. I'm gonna use the zip ties that came with the power supply in case to tie it off, and then we're gonna run it through this hole and plug it into the back of the motherboard. You can see here that I have two zip ties on the cable now. The reason why these are here and this is important is you don't want this cable running on the back of the motherboard. The voltage regulators get very hot around the CPU here. The back of the CPU gets quite hot. You don't want to risk melting the cable. So be sure to tie your cables off. Now we have our 24 pin ATX cable, 24 pin here. This goes into the power supply and we're going to run that up through one of these grommets and plug it into the motherboard right here. With the 24 pin ATX cable plugged in, now we're gonna put our serial ATA power cable to run power to drives here and here. This cable is now attached. I'm gonna put the drives up here. It's connected down here. Now, there are more of these in the power supply package. So if you wanna run a cable up here for serial ATA and a cable down here, there are extra cables in there. And there's also Molex cables as well, which we're not gonna be using. Last but certainly not least is our PCI Express power cables for our video card. Now the video card is going to go about right here and end up here. So I'm going to plug it in and actually run it through the grommet here just to give it a little bit of cable management running around the card. Now we're going to turn the computer over but I'm not replacing the back panel cover yet. We'll need to get back here one more time. We have the case turned over and you can see our 24 pin ATX power connector is plugged into the motherboard here, run through the back grommet. And you can see the eight pin CPU power connector is connected up here in the top, both cables tucked nicely away. It is now time to connect our front panel connectors. I'm gonna move this out of the way here, but we've got a USB three front panel connector here. We also have one pointed up here, which one we use will depend upon the angle of the cable. We also have down here at the bottom, we need to get access to our front panel audio connectors for the headphone and microphone jacks. And then we also need to plug in the power switch, reset switch, etc. When it comes to plugging in the front panel connectors, you simply have to look at your motherboard manual. You may pick a different motherboard, that's fine. The actual orientation and position of each of the connectors will vary from board to board. There's a diagram in every one of these manuals that shows you where the HD audio connector is, how to plug in the reset switch, power switch, etc. So just consult your manual and plug them in because all these cables are labeled. Well, this is definitely an improvement. The front panel connectors are actually plugged in right here. They're running through a bottom hole here, behind the case, and up the channel management. The front panel audio connectors are also running down here and behind the case. I've got the front USB ports plugged in right here. I've got the cable run through here, double backed and run up. So we've cleared out most of the cables, improving our airflow and making our system both look nicer and run cooler at the same time. What you do next at this point is going to depend upon whether or not you're installing drives. I'm going to go ahead and put the drives here and I'm going to go ahead and install them here. You may notice that I've removed the two and a half inch drive mounts right here. These are for SSDs and there's two of them right here. You can absolutely mount them here, but because I'm using one power cable, I'm putting in three two and a half inch SATA SSDs. It's frankly easier just to put all three right here, run one cable to them, run the data cables to the board and be done with it. In the process of installing these cables, I removed the two two and a half inch mounts that are located right here. You can see this right here. I'm gonna install the two and a half inch SSDs to these by screwing through the back on here, and then we'll mount those there. We can then run the power and data cables through those holes. The data cables will run through these grommets here, and the power cables, of course, are right down there with the power supply. This entire tray does not have to stay. When I did the overview of this, I showed the length issue. This will block a Gaming X Trio or a Duke. It does not actually block the Gaming X card that we're putting in here. There is a bit of room. 
However, by removing this, we improve airflow, uh, removing any impediment to airflow from the front fans and make our system look and run cooler. Please note that this can be repositioned. I'm taking it out. However, there are screw holes all along here. This drive cage can be mounted in multiple locations. So if, for example, you have a graphics card up here and you want to mount it on the bottom, or you want to add another one and put six drives here, that's also an option as well. But I'm simply going to take it out completely and open up the inside of the case, leaving more room for airflow. Here you can see the Crucial MX300 mounted to the tray. At this point, we simply stick it right here and screw that into place. We will connect the power and data connectors to those in just a minute. We take our second drive, turn it over so the screw holes match, insert it right into the tray, and then we will just screw that into place. And here we have the other drive mounted in place. Now, for those of you following along with the home game, the original parts overview and the $2,000 budget most certainly did not have five SSDs included. In fact, the only two SSDs included in the $2,000 budget were the 500 gig Samsung 850 Evo and the Samsung 960 Evo NVMe drive, the Crucial MX300 and the pair of Crucial MX300 750 gig drives are just because I need those for my own personal use, but they do increase the cost of the machine. Storage is highly personal. You buy as much as you need. And of course it can increase or decrease the price depending upon how much you buy. Now this is one of the drive trays from here. There are four screw mounting holes. It simply mounts just like so and you screw it in from the bottom. Here's our Samsung 850 Evo screwed in and then we simply drop that into the drive tray. Now I simply have to take the uh, serial ATA power connector and then I simply need to connect it to those three drives and to this one connector here which provides power for the LEDs on the front of the case. We are making progress. You can see that we have our serial ATA cables plugged in here. This top one is running to the Samsung drive and these two with the white connectors are running to these two drives. I am using L-shaped connectors here and this is something you want to think about if you're using cables. The L-shaped connectors are not going to fit on this end. Now, some cables are straight on both ends and some cables have an L-shape. The benefit to the L-shape here is it provides you the ability to route the cable vertically down through the hole by coming up and around. The downside to L-shape is it blocks this PCI Express slot. I don't care. I'm never putting anything in that slot. But if you care, then make sure that your cables are straight on both ends. Interestingly enough, this is almost an argument for having a micro ATX rather than an ATX board. A micro ATX board would actually end right about here. You'd lose a couple of things, you'd lose a slot, you'd lose a couple of ports, you'd lose your second M2 slot, but you certainly move it away from the bottom of the case. This is not the fault of Cooler Master, but if I had any feedback to give to all case manufacturers, if you're going to make your case take a full-size ATX board, make it six millimeters taller and put the extra space down here because frankly, that's pretty cramped. To avoid that, honestly, you have to go to a full tower case. Most of the mid tower cases such as this Master Case Pro 6, frankly, have very little clearance with the bottom of an ATX board. The next thing we need to do is connect all of our case fans, two in the front and one in the back. Now, the one in the back is fairly easy because there's a header right here for it. The problem with the two in the front is that you've got to have case fan headers in the mother in the bottom right hand corner of the motherboard and this motherboard only has one right here there are two up here there's one down there but we've got two fan connectors now the front panel of this case is very easy to take off it actually just peels off from the front which gives access to the fans why is this important this fan in the front i'm actually going to turn 90 degrees there's just four screws i'm going to take that off in a minute and the reason is, is because currently it's set with the cable down here. I want to move it so the cable is up here and then it will reach this system fan header. Now you can use extension cables. You can also use power adapter cables to run them off the power supply. But with the fans running off the motherboard, you can monitor them, which is a good thing. I have now turned this fan 90 degrees. That only took a minute. Undo the four screws, pull the fan out, turn it 90 degrees, stick it in, screw it back in. And now this reaches just fine. The only downside is there's no real cable management for these because they simply have to run straight across. If this bothers you, get a couple of fan extension cables and then you can route them where you want them. For those of you curious what the front of the case looks like with this pulled off, you can see here the two 140 millimeter fans and the screws. Um, there's actually several different ways that you can mount things to the front here, but this simply clips right back on. 
And since I didn't show it before, you simply pull it up from the bottom and that's how you remove it. So it is very easy to do. It's just another step if you need to move where that cable goes. Now the irony is the front cables are too short and the back cable is too long. So I've used one of the zip ties to wrap that around and we're simply gonna plug that straight into the board. That is very tight and it's not gonna go anywhere. It is finally time to install our CPU cooler and thankfully this case makes that very easy. This raised lip up here is where the radiator is going to mount and it is completely removable so you can mount fans and radiators without having to mess around inside the case. This is very, very nice. Now we are going to have to install a back plate to put posts here, which means we need access to both sides of the board. But one question you have to ask yourself is do you want a intake or an exhaust configuration to the fans? We have two intake here. We have one exhaust here. If you set these up as exhaust, you have three exhaust and one intake. If you set these up as intake, then you've got four intake and one exhaust. Now another option is to set these up as exhaust and you can reverse this fan, it's just four screws in the back, you just flip it over, and then you have three intake and two exhaust. That's a highly personal decision as to how you want to handle it. Me, I'm going to leave these fans as they are and I'm going to set this up as an exhaust. There is enough airflow in this case with the graphics card here, a large vent here, the fan and these fans. I don't think heat is going to be a problem, but it is something for you to think about when you're setting up your system. Now, if you decide not to go with the liquid cooler and instead go with a large tower cooler, let me offer you this thought. The case does not come with fans up here. You're going to want to put fans in. So if you put something large here as an air tower cooler, then you're going to want to put exhaust fans up here to suck all the hot air out of the case to improve overall airflow. Installing these liquid coolers is very much a matter of measure twice, cut once. Maybe measure three times. It is not complicated to install them, but you really need to read the entire set of instructions first, and they are on both sides. The pictures are st fairly straightforward. Here you can see the back plate. You can see we need to set up pins, and where you put the pins depends upon which type of CPU socket you have. Remember the thermal paste. Remember to remove this. That's easy to forget. The fans themselves mount onto the radiator with these long screws. They come with it. There's an entire package of various parts. You won't use all these parts because there's Intel and AMD mounts in here, but they go through here and they screw onto the radiator and then the radiator goes onto the case. Here you can see where the back plate, this is the back of the motherboard here. Once you've put these posts in, we then push that through the back of the motherboard and these posts are actually what the water block, the pump, actually screws onto the motherboard. The nice thing is there's no RAM clearance issues. It looks very nice, it mounts just fine, and then you have the radiator in the top. Here you can see we have the Intel side of the back plate. The other side says AMD and we're using the Intel markers. These plastic tabs, if the camera can see it, these plastic tabs slide on over the metal posts. Make sure the metal post is snapped into the black plastic tab which holds it. There are three notches along here and which notch you use depends upon which socket you have. Almost everyone watching this video will use the middle one. The other two are for much older sockets. So use the middle one unless you have a really old system and you'll be just fine. The top of the post has an arrow. You drop it in and actually it won't twist in there because it's shaped inside. You take the black plastic tab, which actually has the space for the post on the bottom and you slide it over, there we go, on top of the post to the second notch. Then you push the post onto the tab and that is secure and not going anywhere. And one more time. I would like to make a clear point here. If you have never, there we go, if you have never installed one of these, putting a liquid cooler in your machine might seem intimidating. If you can build a computer, you can do this. It's really not that hard. It's simply following instructions and putting the pieces together and installing it in your case. This is not at all like a custom open loop cooler, which I do not recommend for the average person, but the average person can put one of these in. If you can build a computer, you can do this. Please remember that these closed loop coolers never need service, never need maintenance. They're sealed. It will last the life of your computer without ever having to be touched. You never refill these. It really is as maintenance free as an air cooler is. 
If there's any downside to liquid coolers, it's simply this. They do in fact have a finite life. Eventually the pump is going to fail and eventually you'll have to replace it. With a large tower cooler, you can generally just replace the fans and you can keep the big metal block. With a liquid cooler, when the pump goes, the entire unit needs to be replaced. But these should very well last the life of your computer. And then when you build a new computer in five years, you can get a new one. I do want to show this bracket installed. These are two pieces of metal for Intel CPUs. They simply slide into the sides. This is the pump that goes on the CPU, and there's simply four screws that go in. There is a different mounting bracket for the different types of CPUs, different for the other Intel chips, and then also for the AMD chips. All the parts are in the package, but this is what it should look like for Intel CPUs, at least modern ones. What I'm showing you right here has nothing to do with this Coffee Lake build. Instead, this is the Ryzen mounting system, and I have to give Cooler Master credit here. If you buy this cooler for a Ryzen, and frankly for a Ryzen 5 1600X or a Ryzen 7 1700X, this cooler will give you an easy 4 GHz overclock. You don't even have to remove the plastic tabs that are on the motherboard. No backplate, no complicated mounting. All you do is you screw these two pieces of metal onto the water block that I showed you before and then you simply clip it onto the board. This is the easiest installation ever, and frankly, I would love to see Intel update their boards with built-in clips so that you don't have to go through all this mounting. So if you do want to buy this for Ryzen, this is included, no need to order any brackets. I really, really love this cooler. For those of you who don't remember, I have this exact same cooler installed on my Ryzen 7 1700 machine that I built more than six months ago, runs perfectly to this day. This is the top bracket off the top of the case. This provides all the mounting points you need for the various fan screws for the radiator. This way we can install the radiator and fans out of the case and then we can simply take the entire unit and install it in. Now you can certainly put it in there and do it in the case, but this just lets you do it away from the case. It makes it a little easier. Here I have the radiator on the table. These four posts simply screw through the fans into the radiator. Now I have the fan set to blow through the radiator and exhaust because it's going to be mounted on the ceiling of the case. Do not over tighten these. Just make them tight enough that they're not going to be loose. You may not even need to use a screwdriver, but you can if you want to. Now it's just a matter of screwing the eight screws in to the top tray. With all eight screws in, you can see the entire assembly. Now we're simply going to drop it inside the case and attach it. Here you can see the radiator and fans now mounted in the case. I really like that this is removable. That made that so much easier. Fighting with trying to screw things into the bottom of a case, I love this feature. Two thumbs up to Cooler Master for making this removable. These are the two fans that go to the radiator. Now, Cooler Master provides a Y splitter connector so that you can plug both of them into the CPU fan connector. These fans will change speeds based upon the temperature of the CPU, they'll run faster when you need them to be, and they'll run slower when you don't. The actual liquid pump plum plugs into the pump header on the motherboard. This is important because the motherboard knows that that pump header should get full power all the time, so the pump is always running. So the variable speed will go to the fans, and full speed will go to the pump. I now have the two fans plugged into the CPU header, and I'll cable manage that in a minute. One question that may come up is, what if my motherboard doesn't have a water pump header? You have the wrong motherboard. If you're buying a i7-8700K, if you're buying a 240 millimeter cooler, if you're building a machine like this and your motherboard doesn't have a water pump header, you pick a different motherboard. To be honest, any decent motherboard at 150 or more of the modern generation should have a water pump header. Now, if you're installing a liquid cooler in an older motherboard that does not have one, then I would plug the water pump, the actual pump itself, into a system fan header, go into the BIOS, and tell that system fan to run at 100% to provide full power to the water pump. All these coolers come with thermal paste. This tube was inside the container. We're gonna put about a rice grain or so onto the CPU itself. Then we're going to put the pump itself on top of the CPU on these four mounting posts using these tie down screws that were included. Once you place the pump on, make sure you hold it and don't let it come back up. As with all the other screws, put each of them on halfway before you tighten them down. Make sure you keep pressure on the water pump so that it doesn't come off the CPU. And then we'll go around and tighten them up. 
One thing that I really like about modern liquid coolers, especially these Cooler Masters, is one person can easily install them. Some large tower air coolers are a two-person job because you got to screw from both sides of the motherboard at the same time. With the liquid cooler installed, now we're going to install our system RAM. Now in the $2,000 build, we have 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 megahertz RAM. I'm actually gonna be installing 32 gigs because this is gonna be my new live streaming machine. And if you're live streaming and recording and game playing and running OBS and doing other things in the background, 16 gigs for modern AAA games is no longer enough. Please let me be absolutely clear that if you're just playing games, 16 gigs is just fine. I'm talking about live streaming and recording and running overlays and multitasking and playing games all at the same time. When you install your RAM, make note that the notch is not in the center, so the RAM is not reversible. It only goes in one way and it goes straight down, straight back up. Make sure that your tabs on both sides are out of the way. The joys of high-end system builds, I kid you not. My G-Skill Trident Z RAM with its very thick heatsink doesn't fit with the liquid cooler mounted in this position and the hoses right here. The edges of the hoses are just a little bit too far over and I kid you not, it blocks the RAM slot for the Trident Z. What is interesting is the Corsair Vengeance LPX RAM actually fits. It's just thin enough, it actually goes straight down and straight out. It's extremely close. I also grabbed a stick of RAM that doesn't have a big fancy heatsink on it and that fits just fine and there's a gap in between. So, I have two choices. I can either switch to Corsair Vengeance RAM and it mostly fits even though it's slightly touching. I can switch to slower speed RAM with no heatsink or I can turn the uh, liquid cooler pump head around. I think I'm gonna turn the head around. Just be aware that is unfortunate because the RAM slots and the CPU slots are pretty much in the same place on every board, at least as far as I know. I have not measured, but you may not wanna put these there if you're gonna use all four RAM slots. Taking this off does give us a chance to see how well our thermal paste application went. You can see here, the CPU is completely covered. Now, of course, there are a little bit of uneven surface areas, but that's because I put it on and then took it off. But you'll note that it was actually very good coverage with almost no overlap. I'm not going to reuse this. I'm gonna wipe off both of them, clean them completely, and then reapply thermal paste. Something I really appreciate about Cooler Master coolers is they provide a tube of thermal paste. Some other coolers, such as the Corsair, come pre-applied. If this were a Corsair H100 240mm cooler, you'd have to buy more thermal paste because it's a one-time use only application, but Cooler Master gives you a tube so you can try again. If you have to buy a tube of thermal paste, MX4 is what I recommend. The older Arctic Silver 5 is also fine, but the MX4 stuff is newer. A good tube of thermal paste will run you about $7, maybe $10 for two tubes. Each tube will last you for a half a dozen applications, maybe more. And now our cooler is reinstalled. Now the downside is the logo is now sideways. I kind of wanted it the other way because I wanted the, the logo to be straight up. Oh well, it is what it is, but now we have no issues with our RAM clearance. You'll notice that I am not installing RGB RAM this time. My Skylake X system has RGB RAM. This does not. This case is going under the desk, and to be completely honest, will never be looked at again, at least when it's actually being used. So the fact that that's not straight doesn't bother me. Just as a side note, I only have these eight gigabyte DIMMs for 32. You can buy two by 16 gigs. If, you buy, if you're buying RAM and you want 32 gigs of RAM, you can buy two 16 gig DIMMs and install them in the outside slots, in which case having it oriented uh, straight up and down with the logo correct would not have been a problem. You can also buy Corsair Vengeance LPX and it also would have fit. I'm just using the Trident Z G skill that I already have. Last but certainly not least, it's time to put our graphics card in. Quick note, this is the AC version of the Gaming Pro Carbon and this is why. This is a AC Wi-Fi card. There are extra external antenna that come in the box. This is a PCI Express 1X card and you could install it in one of these 1X slots. There's actually no AC Wi-Fi on the board. The only difference between the AC and non-AC Wi-Fi version of the board is whether it comes with this card. Interestingly enough, this card also comes with a bonus USB uh, P 
pin header here for a USB 2 port. Not exactly sure why you'd want that on there, but it's on there. It is nice that it's replaceable. If in the future you upgrade beyond AC Wi-Fi to something uh, faster, you can certainly replace the, replace the Wi-Fi adapter and keep the card. Back to our graphics card. Now, the graphics card simply goes into the first slot. Make sure that you push down on this. It will pop up automatically. Line the card up after removing all of your headers with the slot. Bring it far enough back that we don't hit the motherboard and it simply pushes straight down into place. Screw it in. Compared to everything else you have to do to build a computer, that's one of the easiest things to put in place. Then we simply have to take our power connectors and plug both of them in. Our system build is now complete. Graphics card, RAM, cooler, CPU, motherboard, many SSDs, power supply, liquid cooler up here mounted on the top. All the case fans are plugged in. At this point, we simply need to close it up and then we need to plug it in and install Windows. Well, there you have it. The build process is complete. Our computer is together and it is working. Now, for those of you curious, the actual build time for me was two hours and four minutes from starting the camera recording to ending it. But that includes a break to go get some coffee, a break to drink some water, to say hello to my kids when they came home, that sort of thing. I could probably put this machine together in 45 minutes if I wasn't filming it and explaining what I was doing, but I've done it before. I've built hundreds of machines. If this is your first computer, it may very well take you five hours to put it together. That's okay. Take your time, especially if you're building a $2,000 beast. You want to get it right the first time. Now, I will offer this piece of advice. If you build your computer for the first time and you turn it on, and for whatever reason it doesn't work, don't panic. Check your cables and connections. One of the most common mistakes that people make is they forget to plug in the PCI Express power connectors to the video card, or they forget the front panel connectors, or they forget that 8-pin CPU connector up at the top of the board. Make sure everything is snug and secure on the power supply. Make sure the switch on the back of the power supply is turned on. These are all honest mistakes that everybody has made at some point if they've done this for any length of time. If you have any troubles, by all means post your comments down below, but do check all your connections like I mentioned and make sure that everything is fit properly. It is rare that parts are defective upon arrival. It happens, but this stuff is all tested before it shipped out. So as long as you put it together correctly, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, it's gonna work just fine. Thank you so much for watching this build video. Like this video if you like it. Share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge red button directly below. Questions and comments in the comment section. And as always, links in the video description. Amazon and Newegg affiliate links down there. If you found this video helpful and useful, if this helped you get your computer built, please use those when shopping. I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.